Well, good morning, men. Please turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 3, verse 13. Let's begin by uh, doing a shout out this morning. We have some men down in Jamaica. Uh, their name of the group is uh, New Life Men. Uh, in uh, Jamaica, which is uh, just outside of Hudson, New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> no problems with your work. <laughs> the person who put this together for me is such a kidder. <clears throat> Actually, I was out of town this weekend, so I, I did have somebody else do this for me this week. Uh, New Life Men, a group of men from Hudson, New Hampshire. <clears throat> New Life Christian Church, Doug Flynn. Uh, they're meeting on Saturdays at 8 a.m. Uh, this is the same one from last week. Yeah. yeah, this is the same one from last week. So uh, Jamaica, we'll get to you next week. And uh, th these guys, you guys here at New Life, New, New Life Man, we just want you to know that we give you a double portion <laughs> of welcome and blessing and shout out. And so would you join me in, in, in giving an applause that's twice as loud and a shout out that's twice as loud to New Life Men. One, two, three, hoorah! And a second time, hoorah! Oh wow, we got a new thing going here. Okay, we'll see. Um, Journey to Biblical Manhood is the title of the series today. Uh, we're in the second part of uh, three sessions on leadership, faith and life objectives, cards on the table. You can look at that or study the PowerPoint if you're online. And then... The title of this message today is that Jesus picks unremarkable men to do remarkable things. So the message today is a message for all men because every man has a burning desire to do something remarkable, to not be ordinary, that his life would have an impact, that he would make a difference. And I want to give you an example of that right from our own group here this morning. Uh, where did Monus make his way to? Okay, Monus. So this is Monus, and Monus attended the University of Central Florida from uh, Lahore, Pakistan, and then returned and, uh, and has been there for a few years, and today is the uh, head of the physics department at his university in Lahore. And he is a disciple of Aubrey Truex, one of our leaders. So Aubrey poured his life into Monas, as did others. And, and, and Aubrey brought him to be part of this study. And now Monas is back in Lahore, Pakistan, and has gathered a number of Christian professors, and they are going through the book, The Seven Seasons of a Man's Life. And so Monus is a leader. Monus is doing something uh, extraordinary with his life. Now, uh, in Monus's case, uh, he was a remarkable man that's doing remarkable things. <laughs> but just an example of, of what your investments into this ministry and the men that are involved in this ministry are doing not only here in America but around the world. And so why don't we give, uh, hey, why don't we give a shout out uh, to, 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 to Monas just as a way of saying uh, we're proud of you. All right? One, two, three. Hoorah. Welcome. Monas, we're glad to have you back in town. All right. So... <clears throat> So anybody uh, that doesn't think they can make a difference should observe a mosquito. Uh, I was camping three days this week, and there's this most inventive mosquito, and, and he did make a difference uh, in, in my life. So <clears throat> when Steve Jobs, the famous story, when he recruited John Scully, to become 
the vice president and basically the chief operating officer, I don't know what his real title was, but uh, John Scully was a, uh, a, a vice president at Pepsi. And he was responsible for uh, establishing Pepsi as the, the number one brand. And so this was in the mid-1980s, and, and Apple hit a, a billion and a half dollars in sales. But they were really struggling. It was a, a, t a dark time because the Macintosh sales were only like 20% or 25% of what they had projected. Anyway, they were really in trouble. And so Steve Jobs, CEO and founder uh, of Apple, went to see Scully and tried to persuade Scully to come to the Apple company. Now, Scully's a remarkable man. And so why would he want to leave Apple? Why would he want to leave, uh, why would he want to leave uh, Pepsi for Apple? He had everything going for him. And so in his own words, he later recalled in an interview, he said, you know, it was interesting, we were sitting there, and here's this, this man, and I respected Steve Jobs for what he had done. He's, he's there in his uh, uniform, with, you know, his mock turtleneck and his blue jeans and his tennis shoes. And he had said all these things, and, you know, I, I was happy with where I was. And he said that Steve was staring at his tennis shoes, and um, at that time he had a, a bushy hair of, you know, uh, wavy locks and had these steely eyes. And he said, Jobs looked him in the eye and he said, uh, John, do you want to make sugar water for the rest of your life or do you want to come and help change the world with me? And Scully said, I realized it was a defining moment. One of those moments that was a defining moment for my whole life. And so he made the shift and there's a lot of other history that goes with that. But he, but he did come and he reestablished order to uh, Apple and uh, of course Apple today is, I don't know if their cap rate today is the highest, but it's one of the highest of all the companies uh, in, 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 in the global economy. And, uh, and so he, he's a remarkable man. But here's the thing. <laughs> Not everybody feels remarkable. And yet, in the economy of God, what I want to show you this morning is that you can be remarkable. You may feel like all you're doing is making sugar water with your life. I'm going to show you, well, Jesus is going to show you this morning how you can do something remarkable. First up, I want us to look at the leaders that Jesus picked. Mark chapter 3, uh, verse 13. Jesus went up into the hills and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12, designating them apostles, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. So he changed his name like he changed Saul to Paul. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And to them he gave the name, whatever it is, which means sons of thunder. So, and then we see a little bit later that they wanted to call down some, so anyway, probably men with tempers. Andrew, probably, not necessarily. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, a doubter, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, a different one, the zealot, and Judah, Judas Iscariot, uh, who betrayed him. And so, when we look at this list, one of the questions that I'm asking when I look at the text is say, okay, what is, what is obvious? What is obvious about this text? First of all, you know, why, 
why, what, what is the situation that called this text into existence? And that was is that Jesus had a plan. Uh, his plan is total global conquest. His plan is to take his good news, the, the, the message of his love, to this broken generation who in turn will reinvest that in other generations like Monas is doing and like uh, the, the, these men up in New Hampshire are doing and like you are doing and reinvest that that kingdom life into the lives of other men as disciple making disciples. So, so that's his plan. That's what Jesus is doing. That's the situation now that called this into existence is that he is now initiating the second stage of his rocket ship. All right? But what's obvious here to me is that, you know, the population, I looked it up this morning in the U.S. Census, worldwide population estimates for 0 A.D., low, and this is looking at different estimates from different scholars, low of 170 million, high of 400 million people. There are 325 million people in the United States. So the world population at the time that Jesus was making this decision is about equal to the population of the United States. Don't you think he could have come up with some more qualified leaders with better resumes? <laughs> What's obvious here is that he has picked some incredibly ordinary men to take these positions. Uh, when you think about it, he knew who those leaders were that had the resumes. Uh, from the age of 12, he had been with religious leaders and, and, and going back and forth with them. So he knew who was theologically trained and, and who was not. Even in his human nature, he knew that. So, why didn't he look for men like Moses, or Abraham, or Joseph, or um, Job, or Daniel, or David, or Elijah, or, or, or Paul? I mean, why didn't he just look for somebody like Paul right from the beginning? Very interesting questions. So what's obvious here is that J Jesus had some kind of a larger uh, plan in mind. I, I just made a list uh, uh, you know, of, of the uh, things that you could ask about these men. Were these men of great faith? No. They were afraid of the waves. Were these men educated? No. They were not educated men. Uh, we're leaving Mark. Turn over to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. And we could begin at verse 1, but let me just recount that. So uh, uh, Peter and John were, were speaking. They had healed a man, a, a lame man, and they were speaking and proclaiming the gospel and they got arrested. They got arrested. Uh, but even though they got arrested, it says in uh, verse 4, but many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. So the next day, the rulers of the country, there's 71 people in, in the Sanhedrin. And uh, so they... Uh, brought these men, Peter and John, before them. And uh, in verse 8, it says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people. Now, re remember that um, Peter had never been to seminary. <laughs> Peter had never been to college. Uh, Peter was not ever selected to be most likely to succeed senior in his high school class. Uh, never got a distinguished alumnus award from his university. Um, wouldn't stand out in a crowd necessarily. And in the world's eyes was probably a, a nobody prior to his selection by Jesus. And it says, <clears throat> rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple, kind of puts it in perspective, and asked how he was healed, 
then know this, uh, you and everyone else in Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you completely healed. Salvation is found in no one else, no other name under heaven, given to men except Jesus Christ. And then, and this is what I want you to see in particular here. When they saw the courage or the, the boldness um, or the confidence, and you have to ask, you know, where did this confidence come from? <clears throat> because just a short time earlier, we know that all of these 12 men that Jesus had selected had fled in the middle of the night and we know that this man, Peter, from the other scriptures, we know that he had followed along from a distance and, and made himself cozy in a fire outside the, 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 the house of the high priest. And that before the cock crowed twice, he had denied three times that he even knew Jesus. So where did this courage come from? Where did this confidence, this boldness come from? We'll get to that. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. Unschooled, original language, means um, without, without learning or unlettered. These were unlettered men. Ordinary means, literally means unskilled person. They were unskilled persons. So when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Jesus called 12 men on the mountain to be with him and then to go and preach the gospel. And now we see over here in Acts 4 that they have been infused with the boldness of the gospel of Christ himself by the Holy Spirit. Even though they were unschooled, ordinary men, nothing remarkable about them, like, like us. And they took note that these men had been with him. Jesus called these men to be with him and they took note that he had, they had been with him and the difference that caused this boldness, this confidence in Peter is that he had been with Jesus. So they weren't educated uh, weren't accomplished. They were common men. They were not men of great influence. Uh, they did not have special wisdom. They were constantly asking Jesus, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean about that parable? What do you mean? I don't get it. I don't understand. They were not strong men. They couldn't stay awake in the garden. Um, they couldn't keep their word. They, every, every one of them swore they would never desert Jesus, and yet they did. They weren't, they weren't brave men. We already talked about Peter, and then Peter even had to be rebuked. Um, they weren't men of skill, particularly. They couldn't perform even the most simple tasks, at least at first, before being e equipped by Jesus because in the time that they, they were with him. So... So what's the point? The point is that Jesus has intentionally picked men so ordinary, so unremarkable, men like us, he picks men who are so unremarkable, so hard to accept 
that they can actually do the things that they do. And you can think of different people if you would just spend a moment. Uh, a couple of television preachers come to mind. What in the world? How, how in the world does this happen? I mean, that, that person can't even keep his eyes open when he talks. You know? So all kinds of things that are going on. God using these unremarkable people. When there are Davids available, there are, there are Job's available, there are Daniel's available. So what this is all about is that Jesus has chosen to pick men who are unremarkable so that when they do something that is very remarkable, as you can see from the text we look at, that only God can get the glory. That's what's obvious. Jesus picks unremarkable men to do remarkable things so that only he can get the glory. So that men will not worship other men, but that men will worship God. I have so many things uh, taped in the front of my Bible. It would be hard to uh, talk about, you know, know, where to begin. But, but just one from Oswald Chambers, you know, just the idea, a beautiful saint may be a hindrance if he does not present Jesus Christ, but only what Jesus Christ has done for him. You know, what a fine character that man is. That does nothing to, to, to transform men's lives. And that, of course, is what Jesus is uh, trying to do here. And so, what made these 12 men um, so remarkable is not, and what makes you remarkable, or what will make you remarkable, or will continue to make you remarkable, or make you more remarkable, what makes these disciples and us remarkable is not what we do for Jesus. It's what Jesus does for us while we are with him. So I was telling somebody, uh, Cliff here, uh, so we, my wife and I, we went camping in the nice weather here three, three, three nights this week, and I went out hiking on Tuesday. Beautiful weather, fantastic, beautiful scenery, and I didn't say this to my wife, but I said to myself, and I got back towards the end, I said, you know, this is, it's kind of like a nothing day, an unremarkable day. And uh, Wednesday went back out, you know, again, same beautiful weather, same beautiful scenery. And I had this unbelievable, I just, I came back so full, just so and, and, the, and I, was, I thought about it for a couple of hours. I said, well, you know what? And I, it's like blinders went off. And I realized that I felt on Wednesday, like when I'd been hiking, like I had been with him in the presence of Jesus. You know, I'm, I'm praying, he's, I'm talking to him, he's talking back. Not every day is like that. But that day was. And it was amazing. And that's what Jesus does when we're with him. So Jesus calls us to himself to live in him. He equips us when we are with him. And then he sends us to live out our lives for him. Jesus is the one who is doing these things. And so here's the big idea for the day. The more unremarkable I am, the more God can get the glory when I do remarkable. The more unremarkable you are, the more that God will get the glory when you do remarkable. I heard a story this morning, uh, another story this morning about a man who has been mentoring an, uh, an, another man. And now he's getting married and he's, and he's going to be a groom's and way. And, and he's just had a remarkable impact. God. Uh, don't mean to tell you that you're unremarkable, but, uh, you know, you and I together are, you know, we're, we're not, I mean, we're not uh, Billy Graham, okay? We're not 
Noah. You know, most of us are just pretty unremarkable. And yet God has chosen, for whatever reason, to allow us to lead out, to, to do things that are remarkable, so that he can get the glory. So, what does this mean for, for us? Who are the leaders that Jesus is picking today? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So, 1 Corinthians was written uh, probably about 55 AD in Ephesus to the Corinthians. Paul had been there. We know that he was there sometime between the 1st of July of 51 and the 1st of July of 52. Uh, story for another time, but the pro-council and an inscription that has been found and everything. And so, uh, and, and he built into the lives of the believers there, established a church. And then he writes this letter to them. And uh, it, so this is not a Bible study about 1 Corinthians, but I wanted you to have just, just a little background. He's writing to Christians. He's writing to Christians. Now what's obvious about this? I want you, I want you to think about this. He's writing to Christians in about 55 AD. So he's not writing to the original 12 disciples. Who is he writing to? He's writing to unremarkable men who have been discipled by unremarkable men. Do you get that? These, these 12 men, just imagine if they had failed on their mission, but they didn't. Here we are. Look at verse, let's start at verse 26. He says, brothers. He says, brothers. So, who are these people? Who are these people? These are unremarkable people who have been discipled by unremarkable people. Now we, we know that even though they may be unremarkable, they were faithful. Paul tells us to, to entrust this uh, message to, to faithful men. Read on. Brothers, think of what you were. I'm saying to you, as Paul was saying to them, think of what you were when you were called. Called to live in Christ. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Pretty unremarkable. Not many of you were influential. Not that extraordinary. Not many of you were of noble birth. Powerful. Not many. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He chose you to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. I, and every time I read this, I've, I have to tell the story. When I was called from business to ministry, and I loved business when I loved it, and then I didn't, and, 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 uh, and I love ministry now. I don't love ministry any more than I love business when I love that. It's a very false narrative to think that somehow you're going to feel more spiritual if you're in the ministry. I mean, I, I really don't feel any more spiritual, but I do feel called, very called. <laughs> but when I left business and was praying, okay, I, so I left without a plan. <laughs> Uh, I, I had written the book, The Man in the Mirror, and I'd done a few speaking things, you know, like Mary's Prayer Breakfasts, you know. When you have a resume, you get invited uh, after, I, I told a guy uh, a couple weeks ago, who's at the height of his influence in the business community, and he's doing a lot of speaking. I said, well, leverage that now, because, uh, you know, once you, uh, once you're, you're, you're not, you don't have tacky, sticky, worldly credentials, uh, the, 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 the invitations are going to go way, way down. I'm doing a prayer breakfast next week in, uh, uh, Mayor's Prayer Breakfast in Mobile next week, but I haven't done one in a year. You know, I <laughs> used to do them all the time. So uh, I guess that has nothing to do with the story. But anyway, so I go to, <laughs> so I'm praying, and I'm praying, and I, uh, I'm saying, Lord, what, what do I do? What do I do? And I, uh, he put in my heart a few times one word, Jackson. The only place I knew 
that even came close to Jackson or person was Jackson, Mississippi. So I called some guys there. But long story short, uh, I, I went there. They had a need for uh, racial reconciliation. Uh, my best friend at the time was Tom Skinner, African-American guy. He's deceased now. And uh, so anyway, he, Tom and I went in there. And it was interesting because one day after we had, in the early days, we'd been meeting with a, a bunch of leaders. And uh, Dan Hall, Dan, I love you. I'm calling you out though. Dan Hall, who was one of the pastors, as we walked out of the meeting, he said, you know, there's been a group of pastors here in Jackson that have been praying for years. I think it might have been like eight years. We've been praying and pleading with God to send us a man. And he sent you. <laughs> and he said, and the, the scripture that comes to my mind when I think about you is how God uses the weak things of this world. <laughs> So I guess I wasn't very accomplished at what I was doing. I was pretty unremarkable, right? God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. In other words, God gets the glory. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. And therefore, it's written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Uh, I just have to read the rest of these uh, five verses because this is something I read pretty much every week as I'm getting ready to talk to you. When I came to you, brothers... <clears throat> probably would not have thought so lowly or humbly of myself if it had not been for Dan Hall. Thank you, Dan, so much. I appreciate you pointing out how unremarkable I am. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and preaching were not with clever and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that men's faith might not rest on unremarkable man's wisdom. but on remarkable God's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom but on God's power. Big idea. The more unremarkable I am, the more I'm grateful, the more I praise God because the more he gets the glory when I do remarkable. Finally, just a quick thought. You know, what, what Jesus wants to do for you. So, um, Scott McCurdy, one of our leaders, um, at the age of 38, everything fell apart for him. He went personally bankrupt, his business went bankrupt, and his wife was in the process of leaving him. And so he had been leading a most unremarkable life. And it was about to get a lot, lot worse. And uh, over the next couple, three years, he made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ and moved here. And many of us have had the, the privilege of watching Scott uh, submit himself uh, to Jesus, to spend, to have the desire to be with him, to use the language of the day to grow in Christ. And, and, and now, Scott, instead of uh, concealing his unremarkable past, he boldly proclaims, like Paul would do, his unremarkable past. 
And, and, and the result of that is, is that every week I hear about something remarkable that's, uh, that's happening through Scott. Somebody he's having this incredible conversation with on an airplane because he travels a lot. Or, uh, uh, or he's praying with a, 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 an Uber a driver about some problem. Uh, just every week it's something else. God doing all of these remarkable things. And we all know Scott. We know he's unremarkable. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. He's one of us. He's one of us. And so, so, what is the question that we should be asking? What is the question that you should be asking? I think the question is, are you selling yourself short? I think that's the question of the day. I think that's the question we should be asking ourselves. Am I selling myself short? When Dwight Moody, the Billy Graham of the 19th century, <clears throat> one day heard it said that the world has yet to see what God can do with the man who is fully and wholly or completely consecrated to God. And it fired Moody's jets. It, it burned inside of him like like things burn inside of you. And, and he was a man who wanted to do something remarkable, but, but he wasn't that remarkable either. Trust, he wasn't that remarkable either. Trust me, he was a shoe salesman. He wasn't that remarkable either. But, but, when he heard those words, he thought to himself, he said, he said, all he said was a man. He did not say a great man or a learned man or a smart man or a wise man, or an eloquent man, but just a man. And it lies within the man himself whether or not he will make that full, total, and complete consecration to God. I will do my utmost to be that man. And, and what he did is he embraced the fact that he was an unremarkable person, and allow God to get the glory through his life. And he became one of the greatest leaders that's ever walked the face of the planet. Because he didn't sell himself short. And that's the big idea we want to look at here today. I hope you remember this. Think about it. The more unremarkable I am, the more that God can get the glory when I do remarkable. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, thank you for the texts today. Not sure what you want to do, but we pray, we invite you to go ahead and do that in Jesus' name.